Today I'll show you some different outcomes of multiple sclerosis research. It may seem like an esoteric topic, but I hope it will help you to better understand everything you read, see, and hear about the disease. We'll start with MRI outcomes. You're looking at an axial slice through the brain. This is a T2 flare image, and these are typical T2 bright multiple sclerosis lesions. If a lesion is not present on a prior MRI, it's new. If an existing lesion appears larger, that's an enlarging lesion. Modern disease modifying therapies that are highly effective are very good at suppressing newer active lesions which normally correlate with risk of relapses. If a lesion is brand new there can be a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier and gadolinium contrast dye can extravasate within the lesion as in this example this is a sagittal image you're looking at a posterior lesion behind the C3 vertebrae these active lesions are also correlated with MS relapses. Another outcome is brain atrophy or shrinkage here we're looking at sequential MRIs in someone with active relapsing MS. On the left is the baseline MRI. The top images are T2 flare on the bottom with contrast dye. You can see there were many active lesions on the baseline scan and then subsequent scans at year one, two, and three, and four after baseline. And you can see over time the ventricles or fluid filled spaces and the sulci or gaps between the gyri or folds of the brain are enlarging suggesting that the brain is shrinking. It turns out we all have shrinking brains at about 0.2 percent per year just from normal aging but some people with MS can have accelerated brain atrophy if we can slow atrophy to the rate of normal aging that would be a favorable outcome there are also some biomarkers of multiple sclerosis the most common one you'll see in modern multiple sclerosis trials is serum neurofilament light chain this is neurofilament light chain a breakdown product of brain cells that can be elevated in the blood and indicates central nervous system system injury. It does correlate a little bit with relapses and disability progression, but as you can see in this study, people with progression of disability in blue and people with no progression of disability in red had roughly the same levels, so it's not particularly accurate in my personal opinion. This is ocular computed tomography, or OCT, a scan of the eye. Here you see the divot of the macula. This is the optic nerve. These are the blood vessels, and thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer is correlated with worsening visual function, although the correlation between OCT and overall MS disability is not that strong. Now to back up a little bit, there's one thing all of the outcomes I've shown you so far have in common, which is that they're not actually good research outcomes because none of them directly matter to you. What you want is to be able to walk better and farther, have good cognitive function, better vision, less pain, less fatigue, live longer, be able to play with your grandchildren, work, that kind of thing. Those are real clinically meaningful outcomes. We're just hoping that MRI scans and ocular computer tomography correlate with those things. And just because I could reduce the number of lesions you have or make your retinal nerve fiber layer thicker doesn't necessarily mean you'll walk or see better. So we should focus on clinically meaningful outcomes, which we'll focus on for the rest of the presentation. And by the way, this holds true for all of medical research. If I give you a cholesterol lowering drug or recommend a certain diet that lowers your low density lipoprotein, protein, I'm not really trying to make the number on the screen look better. I'm trying to prevent heart attack, stroke, chronic kidney disease, peripheral vascular disease, that kind of thing. And so those are the actual good outcomes, and we shouldn't be satisfied with just changing things which we hope correlate with clinical outcomes. So the most common outcome in phase three MS trials is relapses. So a relapse or flare or exacerbation or attack refers to new neurological symptoms due to inflammation in a focal area. Some common symptoms include pain and vision loss in one eye, numbness or weakness of the limbs, double vision, vertigo, or various other symptoms that usually develop subacutely over several days to weeks. And there's no doubt this is a legitimate outcome. Relapses are bad. You don't want to have them. Some people are hospitalized, take a significant amount of time off work, have to receive treatments such as intravenous methylprednisolone. However, even this outcome has been criticized as a good long-term outcome. And I'll show you why. So it's true that early in the 
disease, relapses do correlate with worse long-term disability. So this is a study on time to DSS-6. So we're looking at the expanded disability status scale. This is a measure of disability in MS research. We'll look more at this later. And 6.0 means that a cane is required to walk long distances, 100 meters or more. And of course, this is a real and meaningful outcome. People prefer to not need a cane in order to walk long distances. And so people who only had one relapse had the slowest progression. It took them 22.7 years on average to acquire a cane. People who had two attacks, again, this is in the first two years of the disease, it was 18.7 years, and had people who had three or more attacks, it was 15.1 years. That's a 7.6 year difference of walking unassisted, very significant in my opinion. So maybe if we can stop these early attacks, we can improve the prognosis. And it makes sense, some people have more aggressive MS intrinsically and have more relapses and tend to do worse long run. However, if we look at the big picture, not just the first few years, but total relapses lapses over the course of the disease, the correlation goes away completely. In this study, we're looking at total relapses, people who had one to two attacks, three to four relapses, or more than five attacks, they all had roughly the same time to require a cane. And maybe relapses aren't as important as we think, and there's a lot of evidence that the timing and aggressiveness of progressive MS, that slow and insidious worsening over time that may go unnoticed at first is the main driver of disability in MS, and relapses are actually of secondary importance. This interesting study compares people with relapsing onset MS, the majority of people with MS, versus those with progressive onset MS, in other words, primary progressive multiple sclerosis. And instead of looking at diagnosis or other definitions, they just chose two time points in terms of disability. So this is the time to go from EDSS4, which is moderate disability, to EDSS-6 requiring a cane. And there was no meaningful difference between relapsing and progressive onset MS, suggesting that relapses may not be that important. The same is true for time to go from EDSS-6 requiring a cane to EDSS-7 requiring a wheelchair for all but short distances. The progression was about the same between progressive and relapsing onset MS on average. Of course, there's a tremendous amount of variability from person to person, again suggesting that relapses may not be that important. Also, there's very strong evidence that people with primary progressive MS, the actual pathophysiology of the disease likely started long before noticed symptom onset. Indeed, if we look at people with progressive MS, activity, which could be new MRI lesions or relapses, does not seem to worsen the prognosis. Here we're looking at cumulative risk of new or worsening disability. There are four categories, people with primary and secondary progressive MS, SPMS, without activity, the N, or with activity, the A. And you can see those with activity had about the same risk of new disability. Furthermore, the subtypes of MS themselves may be arbitrary. This study looked at the rate of brain atrophy in different subtypes, clinically isolated syndrome, relapsing or remitting MS, secondary and primary progressive MS. And it's all the same on average, again, with great variation from person to person, because there's very strong evidence, as I've said, multiple times on this channel that MS is one disease. So overall, I don't think relapses correlate that well with long-term disability, but certainly they're bad and we want to prevent them. And if you see it reported in a clinical trial, you'll likely see the term ARR or annualized relapse rate. That's relapses per person per year. So an ARR of one would mean one relapse per person per year on average. 0.5 would be one relapse every two years, 0.1 would be one relapse every 10 years. So the actual best outcome in MS trials is disability and prevention of disability. And the most common measure used is the EDSS or expanded disability status scale. And it's very complicated to calculate. I have a whole separate video 
video on it in the notes below. It's a zero to 10 scale, zero being the least disability, no disability, 10 being death due to multiple sclerosis. One to three could be considered milder disability, four could be considered moderate disability. At 4.5 to 5.5, it's decreasing ability to walk long distances. At 6.0, a cane is needed, as I mentioned earlier. At 6.5, a walker is needed. And at seven, a wheelchair is needed for distances longer than five meters. And some of the higher levels refer to declining upper extremity function. Now, the EDSS isn't the best either, in my opinion. And here are 10 criticisms of the EDSS. One, there's a lot of variability in the rating based on who's doing the exam. Two people could do an exam, and there's a difference in 1.5 in the score. At lower scores, it could bounce around a lot from day to day. Someone could go from EDSS at 1 to 3, back to 1.5, up to 2.5, whereas at higher scores, it's quite stagnant. And it's not an additive scale. Some disabilities trump others. And it's very driven by function of the lower extremities or walking ability or strength in the legs. Let's say, for instance, that you have poor balance, but you can get around okay if you use a cane, but you could walk long distances. In other words, you have no symptoms of MS. And let's say over the next 30 years, your walking worsens, but you could still walk just barely 100 meters with a cane, but in the meantime, you develop blindness and dementia and chronic pain and severe debilitating fatigue, your EDSS is still 6.0. It hasn't changed at all, so we're really not picking up very clinically meaningful differences in disability. It's not a linear scale. The difference between EDSS of 2 and 2.5 is often very small. In fact, someone with an EDSS of 2.5 could be less disabled than someone with an EDSS of 2, whereas the difference between 6 and 6.5 can be enormous. And some items on the EDSS aren't even real symptoms or disabilities. They're just neurological signs, such as reflexes. Also, for certain scores like 4.5 and 5 and 5.5, they involve walking distance. And by the way, I used to be an actual rater in MS research trials. It's not like I can take the patient out of the office and walk with them for 300 meters. So it's just a game of telephone. I'm just asking them how far they could walk. Also, it's difficult to perform the EDSS. You have to have good experience doing a neurological exam. So relatively few people can perform the exams, so it's harder to get the research done. So I believe a better outcome would be composite disability outcomes, such as the MS functional composite shown here. It consists of four different tests, all very clinically relevant to people with MS, one that measures walking, one that measures hand dexterity, one that measures cognitive function, and one that measures visual ability, and they're simply added together to create an overall composite score. This is the nine hole peg test where you have to take little pegs and put them into holes and then put them back in the bin and it's timed and you have to do it as fast as possible. An excellent measure of overall hand strength and dexterity. And I have to credit Professor Gavin Giovanoni who coined the hashtag think hand where even people with advanced MS, maybe they don't have any walking ability, they still want to preserve their upper extremity function and they want to participate in clinical trials too. This is the symbol digit modalities test, a measure of cognitive function you have to memorize these symbols and the corresponding numbers and then fill in the answers here and do as many as you can in 90 seconds. I actually think a different cognitive test called the PACET or PACE Auditorial Serial Edition Test may be a technically better test, but it's extremely difficult and frustrating and it takes more time to perform. So this may be a more practical choice. This is low contrast letter acuity, simply an eye chart with soft gray letters that are harder to see, very sensitive at picking up visual loss due to optic neuritis. And the last one is the time 25 foot walk test, simply how long it takes you to walk 25 feet. And I previously got a thousand people to sign a petition asking the FDA to not require the EDSS and allow composite disability outcomes in MS research. And I did contact them, but they didn't respond to me. Now, another class of outcomes is patient reported outcomes outcomes reported in surveys by people with the disease. And I think a lot of people are biased against these outcomes. They seem less scientific, but these are very important outcomes. And with proper blinding, I think they can be 
quite reliable. Some of the symptoms of MS are invisible. We can't objectively measure them. We have to ask the person with the disease. Fatigue can be the most severe and debilitating symptom for many people with MS. There are a couple surveys or scales, the Fatigue Severity Scale, FSS, or the Modified Fatigue Impact Scale. This is a good outcome measure. This is something people care about. Mood, there are various scales. How are you feeling? There's the Hospital Anxiety and Depression Scale, or HADS. Pain, neuropathic pain, a very common symptom of MS. Is your pain better, the same, or worse? How would you rate it on average on a scale of 1 to 10? There are also some global scales, the global impression of change. Are you about the same as a year ago when you started the trial or better? Are you slightly better or significantly better? Or are you worse? Are you slightly worse or significantly worse? If more people getting the treatment than placebo are improved, that's a good sign. Also, their overall quality of life scales, the MSQOL, basically different symptoms of the disease and how they affect your overall quality of life. Again, if more people are doing better on the treatment than the placebo, that's a good sign. Now, for unblinded studies, let's say there's a supplement and it's an open label trial, people know if they're getting the supplement or not, and the only improvement is something like fatigue or mood that's totally subjective and no other objective outcome, I can understand how people could be skeptical of that. It'd be nice to corroborate this with some more objective outcomes, but it's a very meaningful outcome that really matters to people. Some other outcomes you might see, the six minute walk test, how far you can walk in six minutes. With the time 25 foot walk test, people may be fast. They can do it in five to six seconds, but they tell me, you know, I can only really walk a quarter mile after that. My legs start dragging, I have to rest. It's hard for me to go to Disneyland or the mall or anything like that. The six minute walk test is much more sensitive to picking up gait disability. There's also bio monitoring. You can just wear an Apple watch. It tells you how fast you walk how far you walk. If people could only walk, say, 5,000 steps in a day, but after an intervention, say exercise, diet, a medication, now they're walking 10,000 steps in a day or they're walking faster, that's showing you something. I already mentioned the other cognitive test, the pace set. I think it's technically a little bit better if you have the time and resources. What about employment? Are people still working or have they gone on disability? That's a meaningful outcome. And some of the older trials and people with MS show that their life expectancy is slightly lower than the general population, but maybe with modern treatments, people are living longer. It would be great if we could demonstrate this in a clinical trial. This is an example of the six minute walk test in a clinical trial. This is the WAVES trial done by Dr. Terry Walls comparing the Walls protocol, a paleo type diet versus the Swank diet, a low fat diet. And after 24 weeks, people doing the Walls diet walked a little bit further over six minutes, though the difference was modest. If you have questions or thoughts about outcomes in MS research, please post in the notes below and let me know if you have ideas for other videos.